Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Today we are kicking off a brand new series titled Celebrate Life. Say that with me. Celebrate Life. And this idea of celebrate life is something that we want to talk about. How do we live in the life that God has in store for us? You might have heard Jesus say, I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. I believe completely that Jesus brings that abundant life, but sometimes we have some hurts or we have some habits or some hangups that get us stuck where we're not seeing the life that God has in store for us. So this series is anyone that's ever been hurt before, everybody in the room, anyone that's ever had a hangup, everybody in the room, and anyone that might have some habits that we need to work on, everybody in the room, right? All right, so let's jump right into it. I had a few, I had a great opportunity a few weeks ago to go and see the beautiful state of Montana. And I have some pictures I want to share with you. This is right outside of our house. So I believe that these horses were wild. And then I learned that a farmer owned them. But I just lied to myself and said that they're wild anyways, because it looks more beautiful that way. You can actually see the brand on this horse right here. That's the farmer's brand. But we got to see the beautiful horses. And then one more picture. This is actually the moonrise. This was taken at midnight as the moon was coming up over the, the mountains. And I think this fine silhouette right here on the floor, that's got to be my silhouette. Look, it's just so beautiful. <laughs> It was a beautiful opportunity, and one of my highlights in Montana is we got to go and see the Little Bighorn River. This is where there's some of the best trout fishing on the planet. I caught one trout, hallelujah, I'll take it. Got my one fish in about nine hours of fishing probably, but I'll take it. And what happens further downriver at the Little Bighorn is we actually got to see a very famous battle in American history. It's known as General Custer's Last, Last Stand. We got to go and see Custer's Last Stand. This historian was walking us all throughout the battleground. He was showing us where the grave markers were, who died. A lot of those boys were 16, 17, 18-year-old immigrants who just were looking for a better, better life. He was kind of explaining both sides of this battle. And one of the things that he explained at the conclusion of the battle was that although the natives were able to beat the U.S. government in that battle, Overall, overall, they were not able to win the war. So he was explaining a little bit of the tactics that went on after. So the U.S. government beats the natives in this war, and they have these natives that they don't want to deal with, but they don't want to just massacre them. So what the U.S. government did, they were very, very sneaky. They took tribes that were historically at war, and they forced them to be neighbors. So tribe A and tribe B, they've been at war for over 100 years. The government says, why do we make them neighbors? I'm going to let you guys keep your weapons. Good luck. Can you guess what followed shortly after? The tribes went to war with each other. Because they were two things like water and oil that don't mix, and they were placed next to each other, they went to war, and the government hoped that one side would die. And as I was talking to this historian, I was like, what was the, what was like the end game? He was like, the end game was they wanted to create an environment where those two tribes would kill each other off. They wanted to create an environment where something would die, where the issues they had had to die. And my point in this illustration is this, that the environments that we place ourselves in has a massive impact on the things that will live and die in our lives. The environments that we place ourselves in have a massive impact on the things that will live and the things that will die. For example, you're working on gossip. You've got this gossip issue that's alive and well inside of you. And you went for two weeks and you've been pretty good, right? And then you see your best friend from 10 years ago that gets you started on the gossip journey. And you just see them, you're like, 
girl, let me tell you what he said, right? And what happens? Gossip, gossip, gossip. You're in an environment where gossip is going to live. On the flip side, there's another person that's working on gossip, and they have friends around them that's calling the best out of them. And every time you start to gossip and complain, your friend says to you, hey, so the person we're talking about is not here right now. Maybe you should go and talk to them about this, or I can help you find a solution. After doing that three, four times, you're not going to want to gossip around that person because you're in an environment where gossip will die. If you're working on eating healthier and your entire friend group is centered around finding the best quadruple cheeseburger in all the world, guess what? You're not going to eat healthy with them. But start to hang out with a bunch of personal trainers and you all go to lunch and they order a quinoa, bean sprout, tofu, vinaigrette, a little something, something, right? And they order it, and then you last in line, you're going to get to the counter like, all right, I got to eat healthy. You'd be like, can I get a double cheeseburger with extra lettuce? <laughs> yeah, and if you could put some, and a, and a Diet Coke, because I'm, I'm being healthy right now, right? Being around it, and someone first service on the front row was like, five guys! We see this idea of our environment having an impact on us in Proverbs chapter 13. It says, he who, walks with the, who, he who walks with the wise will become wise, and the companion of fools suffers destruction. You might have heard it this way. Show me your friends, and I will tell you who you are. You might have heard it this way. You are the sum of your five closest friends. These are all creative ways of saying the environments that we place ourselves in has a massive impact on the things that will live inside of us and the things that will die. And I want to ask you today, are there some areas of your life that needs to die? Are there some hurts, some hang-ups, and some habits in your life that need to die? Are there some struggles that you might be hiding from the world that everyone sees you all happy, but inside you're dying? Are there some of those issues that need to die in your life today? Going on that trip to Montana, it impacted my life so much, not because of all of the new things that I learned, but because I was now more aware of the things in my life that needed to die. This is the beauty of environment. In that environment, I was shown very clearly some things I need to work on. And just the way that the government created an environment where it aimed to destroy certain things, I want us to understand today that there are environments that we can place ourselves in where things will have to die. There are environments that we can place ourselves in where unforgiveness will have to die. There are environments we could place ourselves in that unbelief will begin to die. There are environments we could place ourselves in where depression will begin to die. This is the power of environments. And it's not just me saying it. We see this in the scriptures as well, especially when Jesus was around. Today, if you brought a Bible with you, you can open up to Mark chapter 6. And we're going to be in verse 53 in a place known as Gennesaret. Everybody say that with me. Say Gennesaret. And when you see Gennesaret in your Bible, it was located on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. And just know to yourself, lots of miracles happened here. Jesus was a miracle worker in this place called Gennesaret. And at this point in the story, Jesus has just calmed the waters, has, and now he's in a boat with his disciples crossing over to the shore. And we pick up in verse 53 where it says this. It says, when they had crossed over, so Jesus and his disciples, they came to land at Gennesaret, and they drew into the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him. And watch this. They ran about the whole region and began to bring sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. Now, I understand this is a Bible story, so sometimes we read crazy stuff, and we're just like, yeah, that, that's pretty normal. I don't, I don't see what the deal is there. 
But think about this for one second, that Jesus shows up to Middletown, New York, and he gets off of a bus from the city. And people see Jesus, and all of a sudden, they start going wild. You're at Walmart with your bag of hot Cheetos trying to check out. And the cashier looks at her phone. She goes, oh my gosh, Jesus is here. And she takes off running. And you're like, what is her problem? So you take your Cheetos to the next cash register. And you're like, what was that girl's problem? I don't know. And they check their phone. Oh my goodness, Jesus is here. And people are running to the hospital to get their sick family members to go and find Jesus. They're going to find their kids to bring them to Jesus. Everything in the city stops and focuses on one person that shows up. How crazy would that be today? We keep reading verse 56. And wherever Jesus went, in villages, cities, or the countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces, and they implored him that they might even touch the fringe of his garment. My favorite sentence in this whole passage, and as many as touched it were made well. This is what happens when disease shares an environment with the healer. This is what happens when depression has to share a room with the healer. You see, the same way that there was tribes that went to war, we are a part of a tribe known as God's people. And because we're a part of his tribe and he is our king, there are certain things that our king will not stand for. And one of those things that we see in scripture is sickness and disease. You see, healer was not just something that Jesus did, it is who he was. The Lord is our healer. Over and over and over in the Old Testament, you see God our healer, the Lord our healer, the Lord that delivers us from sickness, right? So when Jesus walks onto the scene and he starts healing people in a Jewish context that knows the scriptures, they say, wait a second, this guy is a healer. Our God is a healer. When Jesus comes and the disciples say, even the wind and the waves obey his name. We see throughout the Old Testament, how many miracles are involving water where God is splitting seas for Joshua, for Moses, where the spirit of God is hovering over the waters, where God is setting the boundaries for the water, right? So there's clues that Jesus leaves in the Old Testament of who he is now. And he comes onto the scene and he shows the people. And we see that because he is the healer, that this environment where sickness was sharing the room with him, the sickness had to flee. Many diseases went to war against Jesus, and they all found the same end. They were all destroyed at his word. You see, there are environments we can place ourselves in that cause sick areas in our lives to die. Not just physical, but also mental areas and emotional areas as well. And one of those environments is known as God's presence. One of those environments is known as God's presence. And because God's presence was there with those people, the disease, when it came in contact with him, it had to die. And as I began to read this story over and over again and try to find at what moment did everything change, I think I found it in verse 54. In verse 53 it says, when they came to the land at Gennesaret and drew into the shore, when they got off the boat, the people immediately recognized him. Say that word with me, say recognized. The people recognized him. And this is where it all starts. Recognition is defined as identifying a person from previous encounters or knowledge. Identifying a person based on previous encounters or knowledge. So that means when they recognized Jesus and they went and they grabbed all the sick, it means that they had a previous encounter or knowledge of who he was. And they said, because Jesus the healer is here, then let us run and grab all the sick areas of our life and carry all of our issues before him. Because if we could just get our sicknesses in front of Jesus, they would die at his word. They said, if I can just get the broken areas of my life in front of the healer, they would be healed in a moment. And because the people had previous knowledge... 
and previous experience of God's goodness, what did they do? When God showed up, they acted upon it. Based on them grabbing all of the sick, it means that they knew that Jesus was a healer. They knew that when Jesus shows up, diseases must die. And we see this all throughout the Bible, that when Jesus shows up, people who are lame begin to walk. When Jesus shows up, people with withered arms begin to stretch out their arms. When Jesus shows up, the blind begin to see. When Jesus shows up, the deaf begin to hear. When Jesus shows up, those who are born broken are instantly restored in a moment. This is what happens when Jesus shows up. And if you're in desperate need today of something in your life, I want you to start by recognizing who Jesus is. If you haven't experienced him for yourself, you can take my word for it. He's pretty cool. He's a pretty good, he's a pretty good God. I can testify for that on my own. One of the most powerful things for me in this story is we see that Jesus goes to the city, Gennesaret. It has a name already. It has its businesses. It has its people. I'm sure there was some form of local government and local businesses. But the second that Jesus shows up, the environment was forever changed. The city kept the same name, but the environment was forever changed because God showed up. When Jesus shows up, family church, everything changes. When Jesus shows up, everything changes. When we study this Greek word where it says that the people recognize Jesus, it's not just like facial recognition when you take out your phone and it unlocks. This word recognized, it refers to having a certain or complete knowledge or a fuller understanding regarding a subject. And as I read this, I'm like, did they have a complete knowledge of the depths of God as a healer? Were they all Bible school students that studied for 80 years where they knew every word and every letter about healing? No, they didn't have that sort of knowing, but they knew deep inside of their core that if they can get their issues to Jesus, that they would be healed. It says that they had a complete understanding of what would happen if they brought their issues to Jesus. They knew if I can just get to the presence of Jesus, the sickness was die, would die. And as we're talking about celebrating life today, I ask you again, are there areas in your life that need healing? Are there some things on the inside that you know need to die? Are there from some wounding from parents or people that you trusted that need to die today? And the reason I ask that is, I don't know if you know this, but healing didn't just stay in Gennesaret. It's in Middletown today. Yes. Healing didn't just stay in Gennesaret on the cross. It actually traveled all the way to Middletown. I believe looking at this story that there are three keys that we can apply to our life when it comes to trusting God and finding healing as we celebrate life. The first thing that the people recognized was they had the knowledge that Jesus was a healer. The second thing was they had knowledge that they needed healing. They had knowledge of their sickness. The third thing is that they took actions to align their beliefs with what they needed. It doesn't say that the people recognized Jesus and they sat still. It says that the people recognized Jesus and immediately they ran. They ran. They ra if someone's running around, I'm like, are they crazy? Unless you have on your running shoes and your shorts that are all the way up to here, I'm like, why is this person just running around? They didn't care what other people thought because I'm getting what I need from Jesus. And some of you in here care more about what other people think than getting what God has in store for you. Do not be ashamed of the greatest message that has ever existed. You are possessing a message that can actually set other people free. That is the power of the gospel message. And today as we're talking about healing, I want us to memorize this little sentence. Well, it's not a sentence. It's actually a horrible sentence. Three words. No, no, no. Act. Say that with me. No, 
no act. The people recognized, they knew who Jesus was. They recognized they needed healing and they acted upon it. It says that wherever Jesus was, that's where the people went. In other words, where healing was, the people went. Where healing was, the people went. It doesn't say that Jesus sat at the library all day and they brought the sick to him. It says that when he was in the village, where did the people go? To the village. When he was in the field, where did they go? If he was in a boat, where did they go? They went to the boat. Why did they do that? Because healing is not a place. Healing is a person. I'm going to say that again for the person in the back. Healing is not a place. Healing is a person. So if you have access to the person of healing, then by virtue of your friendship, by virtue of your relationship, you have access to the healing that he has for you. For example, right now I'm trying to do some things that I do not have the knowledge at all on how to do it. But because I know somebody that knows how to do it, as long as I bring them along with me, I know I'm set. Some of you in here are waiting for something. You're looking for something in all the wrong places because you have access to the one who is the source of what you need. If you're on a lifelong journey searching for love, I want to give you a secret. We are all born with a God-sized hole in our hearts. And only God can fill that void. If you are looking to people who change for unchanging love, you're going to be disappointed every time. If you're trying to fill an eternal void with a temporal person, you're always going to be disappointed. And what I love about God is that he doesn't just do the things that we need. He is the things that we need. That's why in the book of Exodus, when Moses asks, who should I say sent me? The answer that God gives, I am. I am. There's a space after it. I am healer. I am the Lord, your peace. I am the Lord, your strength. I am the Lord, your rock. I am the bread. I am the door. I am the resurrection. It goes on and on and on. Whatever you're looking for today, the I am is your solution. What I love about this story is that the belief that the people had led to action. Their belief led them to act on certain things. Read through the book of Hebrews and the book of James in the Bible and just count how many times is faith accompanied with an action? How many times does that knowing, does that belief lead to an action? It says in Hebrews 11 that by faith, that Abel, he offered, he had an action, he offered a better sacrifice than Cain. It says that by faith, Noah, he built an ark. It says by faith, Abraham, he offered up his one and only son. It says that by faith, that Rahab hid the spies over and over and over again in the Bible. We see that faith is accompanied by an action. And in our story today, by faith, the people brought their diseases to the presence of Jesus. By faith, the people brought their issues into the presence of God. And I want to ask you today, by faith, are you willing to bring your issues to God? Not just the hurts and the hang-ups and the habits. Are you willing to bring God your struggles, your stories, and your secrets? Are you able to bring the things that you're ashamed of before God? Because here's what a lot of us do when we go to church. We've got our issues that we walk around with all week, and we get to church, and we get to the front doors, and we say, all right, I'm the church version of myself. I'm going to leave all my struggles and all my hang-ups behind me. And we just want to be in church perfect, and then we leave, and we pick up our struggles and we go a whole nother week and we get back to church and we leave our struggles in the parking lot 
and here we are again. I want you to understand something. That faith is not leaving your struggles at the door. Faith is saying, I have struggles, but I know a God that is greater than my struggles. I've got some issues, I've got a past, but I know somebody that is greater than my past. And by faith, we can bring the worst version of ourselves to Jesus and leave different than when we showed up. This is the action of faith. And I think sometimes we want to have faith and we want to take the actions, but some of us might feel unworthy of healing. You say, you wouldn't be talking about God healing if you knew what I did in the past. If you saw my past, you wouldn't be saying this sermon right now. Well, God knows your past. And in knowing everything that you would have done, he knows your future, everything that you're going to do, he still thought you were worth saving. So if God thought you were worth saving, I think that you should do the same as well. If you come to church and you leave your sicknesses at the door, I want you to know that's backwards. You should have the book bag with all the sicknesses on and come marching up to the front to the prayer team and say, I've got all this, and I can't do it on my own. But I know that he can. And because I know that he can, I'm going to bring my issues with me. If you're guilty today, I was doing a little bit of reading about guilt. And one of the third synonyms or similar meaning words to guilt was the word self-condemnation. Self-condemnation. We see in John chapter 3, verse 17... It says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Yes. He didn't send Jesus to condemn the world. But funny enough, we'll condemn ourselves. I want you to know if Jesus isn't condemning you, then you should not condemn yourself. Amen. And last I do when it comes to this part of the story, it says that all who reached out to Jesus were made well. All who reached out to Jesus were made well. He didn't take out a clipboard like, how long have you been in your sins? 12 years, by. He didn't say, how long have you been struggling with this? 20 years, bye. He didn't say, do you believe in God? He didn't say, are you a Christian? He didn't say, do you go to temple every week? It says that all who reached out were made well. If we would just reach out today, your past does not disqualify you from being touched by God. We see in the Bible from the uppity religious Pharisees all the way to the outcasts of society, the woman caught in the act of adultery, that Jesus has time and healing for all. If you look at the story of Nicodemus in the book of John, he starts out by sneaking to Jesus at night and asking questions. And he says, you must be born again. And he's wondering, how can a man enter back into his mother's womb? And by the time Jesus is crucified, he brings 75 pounds of spices to his body. He brings a burial that is fit for a king. That is the story of God's goodness. That those who would approach him in the darkness are openly at his grave, anointing his body for his death. We see in scripture, and we know this in our own lives. We know, if I ask you, do you know that God's a healer? Most of us would say, yes. Do you know that there's an area in your life where you need to work on it? All of us will probably say, yes, unless we have denial problems then. That's a different issue to work on. And now there's the hard part of our story, action. We have the knowledge, we know we need help, and we know there's a God that helps us, but the hard part many times is taking the action steps. Today as we're talking about this action of healing, I wanna remind you that our actions are an extension of our faith. You might have heard it before that you don't have faith if you go and see a therapist. You don't have faith if you're going to see a doctor. 
I want you to know that is completely backwards. That sometimes faith says, I'm going to move forward even though I'm scared. Sometimes faith says, I'm going to ask for help even though it hurts my pride. Faith says, I'm going to trust God even when I don't know what my next step is. And I want you to know today that it is not less of a miracle to get healed through a process than it is to get healed instantly. It is not less spiritual to be healed through a process than immediately. We have extremely consistent healing and miracles that are happening every single week at Family Church. This organized system of healing is available to people of all ages. And every Thursday night at 7 p.m. here at Family Church, Jesus is in the room and miracles are taking place. We have a program known as Celebrate Recovery. And many times people hear the word recovery and we say, I don't need that. I'm not addicted to drugs and I'm not addicted to alcohol. No, it says we work on hurts, hangups, and habits. Habits are the end of the train. It starts with the hurt. We all have hurts. And because we all have hurts, guess what? We all need the process of healing. Celebrate Recovery is a small group environment that is a safe space where people with hurts, with hangups and habits, aka all of us, are welcome to arrive and find healing. And many of us hear that there's a solution in front of us, right? We know that God heals. We know that we need healing. And now this action is a difficult step to take. And I wonder, why is it difficult to ask for healing sometimes, to ask for help? You know what the truth is in my life? Sometimes I'm more comfortable in my sick bed than I am asking for healing. Sometimes I'm more comfortable living in the diseases of my past than asking God to help me through it. Sometimes our diseases are so ingrained to who we are that we wouldn't know who we are if we got help. We wouldn't know what our identity would be if we got free from that one area where we've been stuck. And I want us to understand something today, that sometimes our pain is central to our identity. And because our pain is central to who we are, we don't want to let go of it. Because if I let go of it, I won't have an identity. Well, I want you to understand something today. That in the book of Galatians, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So when you take on the identity that God has for you, there is no void. There is no void. Actually, the false identity, that's an imposter. That is a false identity. Identity theft is a crime. You will go to jail for identity theft. And some of us are letting the things of our past steal our identity. If there's things in your past that are stealing your identity, here's what I want you to do. I want you to call the Jesus hotline up in heaven and report. It's like, hey, God, there's this issue that's inside of me. I'm believing these lies. And when you bring those issues into the presence of the healer, guess what happens? The healing begins to take place. We know, we know, and we act. And I know the process can be difficult of finding healing. But my second and final point today is trust the process. Trust the process. It's amazing when we see instant healing, whether it's physical or emotional or mental health issues. But did you know that the process of healing is a miracle as well? Did you know that the process of being changed over time is a miracle as well? The difference between the instant healing and the process of healing is I can't necessarily walk somebody through an instant healing every time. But the process of healing, if I've been through it, I can walk somebody else through it. Because the people in Gennesaret, it says that they had a previous knowledge or encounter of what Jesus was capable of. 
And some of you in this room have a previous knowledge or encounter of the God that can save my marriage, of the God that healed me of my disease, of the God that kept my kids when they were running around. And because you've encountered God as that, when somebody else is at the front crying, I don't know what's going to happen, you can whisper, hey, if he did it for me, guess what? He can do it for you as well. That is the power of the process. Family Church, I want us to understand that Jesus is still healing today. That healing did not stop at Gennesaret. And I want you to understand that many times God will heal us through the community that surrounds us. Many times God will heal us through the community that surrounds us. Someone's about to want to throw a rock at me when I say this next sentence. God did not design the church to only rely on him. God did not design the church to only rely on him. The analogy that the Apostle Paul gives for the church is a body with Jesus Christ as a head. And it says specifically that an arm cannot say to a leg, I don't need you. He says specifically, we cannot look at other members of the community and say, I don't need you because I've got Jesus. Because we are all designed to rely on one another. If you have ever watched Animal Planet and you're watching lions hunting and you're watching the whole herd and they're all together and this one dumb gazelle goes off by itself and the camera zooms in on it and you're like, oh my gosh. Girl, get back with the herd. He's right there. And yelling at the TV because we know that the one who is in isolation is most open to attack. But when it comes to the church, we think we can isolate ourselves and be fine. God designed us to rely on one another. Imagine you're praying to God, God, rent is due. I don't have the money. I need $1,000. And somebody in the church walks up to you like, hey, I was praying and I feel like God wants me to give you $1,000. And you say, I'm trusting God. I don't need your money. God's my provider, not you. And God's in heaven like, Miss Ma'am, exactly what you asked for is in front of you, but God does it through community. James chapter 5, I'm going to fast forward to verse 15. It says, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Verse 16, therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. It says, confess your sins to one another. It says, pray for one another. I want everyone real quick to look left and look right. Look at the people in the room. Look left and look right. Right now, we're at church and we're sitting in rows. And rows are great for information, but circles are great for healing. Circles are great for healing. There is a healing that happens when we come together at an environment like Celebrate Recovery. Many of us here, we want the results that God has promised us without walking through the process that he set before us. We want the results that God has promised without the process that he's set before us. So we know that God is our healer, right? It says it in scripture that God heals. And we say, God, I have this mental health issue and I'm asking you to heal me. And God says back, okay, go to celebrate recovery and talk about it. And we say, God, that's not what I asked. I asked you to heal me. The next person, God, I want you to heal me of my unforgiveness. He says, okay, go to celebrate recovery and confess your sins to one another. I said, heal me. I didn't ask to, to spend my gas and go to celebrate recovery. I just want you to heal me. We want the promise of healing without the process that God has laid in front of us. I want to encourage you today 
that if you're nervous about the process, that that's okay. If you're even scared of the process, that's okay. Sometimes getting help can be scary. Sometimes moving forward can be scary. But I promise you that as you take on that area that you fear, as you walk forward in faith, even in the midst of your fear, I want you to know that God will change your life. When Jesus shows up, everything changes. And as I close today, I want to encourage you that the road to recovery, it begins with just one step. The road to healing begins with just one step. When I went to Montana, I was hanging out and we're all having a good time, we're talking, and then somebody mentions this God-forsaken activity known as cliff jumping. If you don't know what cliff jumping is, it's jumping off a cliff. <laughs> Unprovoked, it's not like we're gonna give you $1,000 or we'll save your family, it's just no, jumping off a cliff for the sake of jumping off a cliff. And as you can imagine, I did not want to jump off a cliff, but if I wanted to go on the pontoon boat to see all the beauty of, the, of Montana, this cliff jump was gonna show up. And as I went to go and do this cliff jump, I was terrified, and I think we have a video of it. Do we have that video? Go, Come on, guys! Come on, guys! We're thinking about it. Don't think, just do it! So I go to this cliff jump, and you see what I did at the top, right? I froze. I was afraid. My fear had me stuck. But in that moment where I was stuck, did you, did you hear it? The, go Josh! There is the voice of a friend that was calling me forward. And because there is a voice that was calling me forward off that cliff, even though I was scared to jump, I was confident in what he said to me. We have somebody known as the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us, that calls the best out of you. And the voice of the Holy Spirit will always lead us to healing. If you think that the voice of the Holy Spirit is leading you into abuse, do the opposite of that Spirit's voice. That is not the Holy Spirit. If there is a voice that is leading you to destruction, it ain't, it's probably you, quite honestly. But the voice that leads you to healing, to restoration, to step out in faith in the areas where you are afraid, that is the voice of the Holy Spirit. And today as we close out, I want to encourage you, if you are hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit as I'm talking through this message, you probably have like a knot in your stomach of the idea of getting help. You probably have a knot in your stomach at the idea of the future being different than the past. If that's you today, you're saying, I wanna get help, not just physical healing, maybe not just even a mental healing, maybe it's emotional healing. I wanna encourage you today to check out Celebrate Recovery and to take that first step in the healing that God has for you. I wanna make it very simple, not as a joke, but sometimes it, it helps us to hear things this way. This Thursday at 6 p.m., you can set an alarm on your phone. You can do it right now, you can do it in the parking lot. Set an alarm that says, get dressed, you're going to celebrate recovery. Get, in your, get dressed, don't show up with no clothes, that'd be weird, get arrested. <laughs> get dressed, get in your car, turn your car on, you're gonna drive from your house to the side building. You're gonna park in that side building, you're gonna get out your car, you're gonna walk up to a blue door, you're gonna open it, you're going to walk up the stairwell, turn left around the corner, and you're going to let God do the rest. You're going to let God do the rest and be amazed at the healing that takes place in community. 
as I close out today, if there's anyone that's in this room that says, I need help in an area, I need prayer right now, I'm feeling desperate in a situation, I need a touch from God, we're going to have our team up here at the front, I'll be down there as well, and we will pray for you. And if you're here today and you're saying, I want to know this Jesus that you're talking about, you're talking about God as the I am, as a healer, as a restorer, as one that brings dead areas back to life. You know, I'm dead on the inside. I want you to know today that when Jesus died and rose from the grave, that he rose with all authority, and that he's given that life to us. The Bible simply says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And we do that today by praying a prayer together. It goes like this, repeat after me. Dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart, come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.